In this section, we'll take a look at conservative vector fields and what it means for a vector field to be conservative and what that means in terms of finding solutions. By the way, this is not political. There's not liberal vector fields or moderate vector fields. It's just conservative vector fields, which, like I said, has nothing to do with political views. A conservative vector field essentially means that it conserves energy. So if you went from a path through a vector field and then you took a different path and then you took a different path, it would produce the same line integral value. So it gets its name from conservations of energy. This little link down the bottom is also in the PowerPoint, and it shows you that you can pick all different paths to get from point A to point B through a vector field. And if the vector field is truly a conservative vector field, the value of that line integral will remain the same no matter what path you take. That's why it's called a conservative vector field. So if a vector field is a conservative vector field, then it follows these rules. Conservative vector field means that the vector field is the gradient of that function on a region. So take the gradient, take the partial derivatives, set them equal to each other, and you'll get these three relations. The partial derivative of f with respect to y and the partial derivative of g with respect to x should be the same. So f and g are the first two terms of that vector field. The partial f with respect to z and partial h with respect to x should be the same. And then the partial g with respect to z and h with respect to y should be the same. So if those three things are true, then you have a conservative vector field. And conversely, if you're told as a conservative vector field, then those three things must be true. So the question is, are the following vector fields conservative? So take a look at number one. Number one, the f is the first term. The g is the second term. So we should take the derivative of x with respect to y. So the derivative of f with respect to y is just zero, right? The derivative of a constant is zero. What's the derivative of the second term with respect to x? Also zero. They're both equal to each other. So yes, it's a conservative vector field. All right, how about number two? Take the derivative of the first term with respect to y, and you get negative one. Take the derivative of the second term with respect to x, and you get positive one, not equal to each other, not a conservative vector field. All right, take a look at the third one. This has got x's and y's all mixed together. So in this case, if you take the derivative of the first term with respect to y, then you get what? Nothing for the first piece, 2xy for the second. The derivative of g with respect to x yields nothing for the 2y to the third, but over here yields a 2x times y. Yeah, they're equal to each other. Conservative vector field. I have on number four. Number four is the only one of the four that I put on here that's in three dimensions. So what do I need to do? I need to, if this is f, g, and h, I need to take the partial derivative of f with respect to y, which just gives me z. Then I need to take the partial derivative of g with respect to x, and I also get z. Okay, so let's keep going. If we get one that's equal, there might be others. Take the partial of f with respect to z, and I just get y. All right, take the partial h with respect to x, so h is the last term here. Derive that with respect to x, and I also get y. Uh, let's see if this works for the third one. Partial g with respect to z, so the middle term, derive that with respect to z, and I just get x. Take the derivative of the last term with respect to y, and I also get x. So yes, all p three of those pieces are equal to each other. It's a conservative vector field. Right, this is just a restatement. In fact, this is a restatement from the old book because it's theorem 14.3 instead of 17.3. But this is a test for conservative vector fields. Partial f with respect to y, g with respect to x, f and z, h and x, g and z, h and y. And if you have vector fields in R2, the only thing you have to worry about is the partial f with respect to y and partial g with respect to x being the same. If it is, then it's a conservative vector field. All right, if you're given a conservative vector field, you can go back and find a potential function. So for this vector field, I can integrate f with respect to x, derive it with respect to y, set my results equal, find the constant, which in this case is actually a function, and then combine my answers. So here's the question. My vector field is negative y, negative x. 
I want to go back and find the potential function. So the first thing is integrate the first piece with respect to x. So integrate negative y with respect to x, which will give me negative yx plus a constant function of y. Because if I derive that with respect to x, I'll get back 0. Now it says take that answer and derive it with respect to y. So if I derive negative xy with respect to y, I'm going to get negative x plus, well, I don't know what c of y is, so the best I can do when I derive it is get c prime of y. Now, the third thing says set your results equal to g to find c prime. So what is g? g in this case is negative x. So set negative x plus c prime of y equal to negative x. What does that mean? That means that c prime of y is equal to 0. So c of y can be any real number, because when you derive it, you'll get back 0. So why not just call it 0? All right, so that's actually step 4. And step 5, it says combine 1 and 4. So combine 1, which is negative xy plus 0. That was my potential function. So I work backwards to find my potential function. All right, this leads us to the fundamental theorem for line integrals and path independence, which is what? Which is, again, going back to that idea that if it's a conservative vector field, then my path from point A to point B doesn't matter. So the value of the line integral is going to be independent of the path. It's not going to matter which path I take to get from point A to point B then because it's a conservative vector field. So I can do it without writing the path in parametric form. I don't have to go through writing everything in terms of t because the path doesn't matter. All I have to do is take the antiderivative of the vector field and evaluate it at the endpoints. So I'm going to do this two ways to show you how it works and why this is such an important idea and the time that it can save you. So here's the actual fundamental theorem for line integrals. This says if we know the potential function, then all we have to do is evaluate the potential function at the endpoints and subtract them, and we'll get the value of the line integral. So rather than doing the whole parametric work for the line integral, we can evaluate that potential function at both endpoints and subtract them. Great. How does this work? Let's take a look at this function over here. Phi of xy equals x squared plus y squared over 2. The curve is sine t cosine t for values between 0 and pi. So again, I seem to have lost my dots like I did in the last video. I don't know why. But this is the dot product of those two things. So let's do it with a parametric definition. And then let's do it with the fundamental theorem for line integrals. All right, parametric definition, that is my x. That is my y. So I need an f and a dr in order to do this. So the first thing is, if my potential function is x squared plus y squared over 2, then I should find the gradient. So the gradient is going to be 2x over 2. That's the first coordinate. 2y over 2. So that gradient is xy. Well, now let's replace the x with a sine and the y with a cosine. And so that gradient becomes sine of t cosine of t. All right, so there's my f. Now I need a dr. Well, r was given as sine cosine, so the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Now, for this, I'm actually going back to the r that was given in the original problem. It's actually the same as the gradient, but I don't want you to think that it's always the derivative of the gradient. It just happens in this case that the gradient is xy, but if it were anything else, then it wouldn't work out that way. All right, so now we need the dot product. So we need the dot product, and then we need to integrate it from 0 to pi of 
the gradient dot dr. So this will give me the integral of sine t cosine t minus cosine t sine t, which is the integral from 0 to pi of 0, which is 0. All right, what's my other option? Fundamental theorem for line integrals. So the fundamental theorem for line integrals looks like this. We know that r was given as sine t cosine t. Because we're told it's a conservative vector field, let's evaluate r at pi. r at pi is sine pi cosine pi, the sine of pi is 0, the cosine of pi is negative 1. All right, what is r of 0? It is the sine of 0, cosine of 0, which is the point 0, 1. So now I should evaluate my potential function at 0, negative 1, since that was the pi subtract the potential function at 0, 1. So my potential function is up here, x squared plus y squared over 2. So I get 0 plus 1 over 2, right? When you square a negative 1, you get a 1, minus 0 plus 1 over 2. And look at that. 0 plus 1 is 1 half. That's a negative 1 half. Half minus half is 0. Same answer. Conservative vector field. If I can evaluate it with the parametric form, the f dot dr, I can also do it using the fundamental theorem of line integrals, and I'll get the same answer because it's a conservative vector field. All right, this one just says use the fundamental theorem of line integrals to evaluate, those are the missing dots, the gradient of the potential function dot product of r prime. So you could do this by substituting, finding the gradient, substituting your x, y's, and z's, finding r prime, doing the dot product, and then integrating from 0 to pi. But why not use the fundamental theorem of line integrals? All right, so the, the function is x plus y plus z. So let's find at t equals pi, I'm going to get sine of pi, cosine of pi, pi over pi. So first I need the endpoints, and then I need to throw them into the function. So the sine of pi is 0. Cosine of pi is negative 1. That's positive 1. Right? Find the point at the other endpoints. So t of 0 is going to be the sine of 0 the cosine of 0, and then 0 over pi. So sine of 0 is 0, 1, 0. All right, just as a reminder, our function was x plus y plus z. So I should evaluate that at 0, negative 1, 1. All right, that's the right endpoint, minus that function evaluated at 0, 1, 0. All right, because it's just x plus y plus z, this side over here is 0 minus 1 plus 1. Over here, it's 0 plus 1 plus 0. So that gives me 0 minus 1, negative 1. That takes care of the entire line integral, right? That whole integral of the gradient of the potential function dot product of the path derived integrated over 0 to pi, I could do much faster because as a conservative vector field, doesn't matter what path it takes. Right, and this is just a restatement of this, but it actually adds another little symbol to it that maybe you haven't seen before, and that is the little circle that's on that integral over there. Right? That little circle there tells me it's a closed curve. So if I'm integrating over a closed curve, then putting that little circle there indicates that it's a closed curve. 
what does this line integral tell me? That if I have a conservative vector field, then integrating f dot dr over that closed curve will give me zero. And so maybe that's a symbol you haven't seen before. There it is again. All right. Again, I seem to have lost all my symbols on this. I don't know why, but there should be a closed curve symbol on here, and that should be a dot product. So I want to do this for f equals yx. That's my vector field. My closed curve is a circle of radius 8. All right. So which way is this going? The circle is oriented counterclockwise. So counterclockwise is going in that direction. So that's the direction we would normally expect it to go. So x is equal to 8 cosine t, y is equal to 8 sine t. Which means that I can write this vector field as f equals y, which is 8 sine t, and then x, which is 8 cosine t. All right, this thing up here is my r of t. So if I want r prime, then r prime is the derivative of that. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so negative 8 sine t. The derivative of sine is cosine, so 8 cosine t. All right, when I go to set this up, I want f dot dr. So there it is in parametric form. Now I want the integral from 0 to 2 pi of f dot dr. Sine times sine is sine squared, so I get negative 64 sine squared t plus 64 cosine squared t. All right, pull out your 64s. Rewrite your sine squared as 1 minus cosine 2 theta over 2. Rewrite your cosine squared as 1 plus cosine 2 theta over 2. Why am I saying thetas? They should be t's. So this will give me negative half plus a half a cosine of 2t. This will give me positive half plus a half a cosine of 2t. The halves go away, and a half plus a half is 1. So we're integrating cosine of 2t with respect to t. So the integral of cosine is sine, so that will give me a sine of 2t over 2 times 64 at 2 pi and at 0, which just gives me 0. So it must be a conservative vector field. I performed f dot dr, and I ended up with 0. And that's the end of conservative vector fields.